Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's graph reading group. With Ji Wu Kim uh, presenting his new graph transformer architecture and this awesome idea there. So let's get into that. And if you want to join the reading group sessions yourself, the information is in the description. So I'm a PhD student in KAIST working on graph and equivalent neural networks. And today I'm going to present to you about a new graph transformer. Just a minute. So can you see my screen? Yep, we can. OK. So uh, the title of the paper is Pure Transformers are Powerful Graph Learners. And in this paper, we explore how to use, I mean, unmodified pure transformers with unmodified cell potential for, I mean, in purpose of graph learning. And the theory, uh, this is, I, I consider this as a theory work. So the theory is based on the equivalent neural networks based on permutation symmetry of the graphs and hypergraphs. So let me introduce my paper. So uh, jumping to the conclusions, in this paper, we basically present um, this model. This is kind of everything. I mean, this is like 80% of our contributions. So given a graph, unlike the traditional, I mean, graph neural networks or message passing neural networks, we are going to tokenize the graph into independent nodes and edge tokens. And we are going to augment the tokens with appropriate token-wise embeddings, which is composed of, I mean, node-wise identifiers, which are also normal, and type identifiers that specify this node or edge, uh, the, whether this is node or edge. And after augmenting the, I mean, node and edge tokens with these embeddings, we are going to just feed them to a transformer encoder. And if we need some kind of graph level prediction, we are just going to add a graph token. This is, this is pretty much everything. So uh, a large body of this work is dedicated to justifying why this architecture can work. Yeah, so we apply pure transformers directly to graphs by treating all the node and edges as separate tokens and augmenting them with simple tokenizing embeddings. So uh, our justification is um, both theoretical and in terms of practice. So in theory, we prove that this approach is probably as powerful as KIIGN. And in practice, we are going to show that this um, approach yields some surprisingly, perhaps surprisingly good performance on large scale learning on PCQ and P2 data set. So uh, about the motivation. So one of the questions I got after publishing this work is why do we need pure transformers for graph learning? So well, why uh, do we do it? Maybe, first of all, what do you mean when you say pure transformer? Like, oh, yeah, uh, let me. What is the standard, the standard non pure transformers? Ah, OK, so let me clarify that. Um, by pure transformer here, I'm referring to the, I mean, basically the architecture that's composed of three things. First of all, it should have some kind of tokenizer that tokenizes the input data into a set of tokens. And secondly, it should have some kind of notion of positional, positional embedding that specifies um, the positional feature of each token. And third, it should, it should be composed of pure cell potential, which is just um, the product of the features followed by supplements. And lastly, it should have residual fit for network. So that's the, basically the pure transformer I am talking about. Yeah, okay, so something yeah. like uh, to be babies generalizing transformers to graphs that would not be a pure graph transformer or yeah. like the, the paper by Dom where we yeah. like the scalable, uh, strong, yeah, yeah, right, positional yeah, encodings, blah, blah, for yeah. graph transformers. This would also not be a pure transformer because they have like message passing layers in mm -hmm. between the self-attention layer, right? That's yeah, right. Yeah, and right. If, we, if we, for example, take a transformer and then mm -hmm. we throw sign net in front yeah. of it, mm -hmm. would you call that uh, a pure transformer? Because we just produced yeah. the positional encoding with mm -hmm. sign net. Um, that's a good question. I mean, um, putting the message passing inside this neural network would definitely make it not pure in terms of my, I mean, rhetoric here. Uh, but sign it, uh, I think it's kind of a gray area, but uh, 
if we, I mean, I'm gonna proceed to why need, we need the pure transformers. And here, the one of the reasons is that we are gonna consider multimodal learning settings where the data is composed of multiple modalities. But in this case, um, using Signet would be okay because we can just um, prepare yeah. the embeddings before we feed the embeddings to a main model. And that's, yeah, but, I think that's okay. But now, for now, let's just say non-pure transformers are stuff like, we have a few self-attention layers, but we also put uh, usual message passing layers in between them. Yeah, right. And it's, okay, but then, and then why are you saying that it's nice to have pure transformers? Um, okay, so... I guess that's what you want to get to here, right? Yeah, so I, I, yeah, I am being a little bit strict here. So, um, um, so one of the major reasons is that we are considering some kind of future extension to multimodal learning setups. I I'm going to talk about it later. Yeah, I think the main reason is that we are considering, I mean, extension to, I mean, more general uh, setup where there's a lot of modalities. In that case, we would not want to put message passing inside the model because the model doesn't want to care about the modality. It doesn't, it just want to see the setup tokens. Okay, so yep. you're saying that maybe we want to pre-train with non-graph data and then um, also do something with graph data or, or what? Uh, that's one reason, that's one scenario. And another is that, um, for example, consider we are, for example, we are processing images jointly with the same graph. So we are seeing both the image, image and the same graph, but we are using a single model. In this case, um, one approach allowed by using a pure transformer for graphs is we are going to just tokenize everything. We are, going to, we are going to tokenize the graphs and we are going to tokenize the image and we are going to uh, just send everything into a single model. So that's one new approach for multiple multimodal learning enabled by using pure transformers. Okay. Well, yes. and then the idea is that maybe our model does better because I don't know, we trained it on all of this image data as well, or yeah, I, I'm I'm not so sure why the multimodal yep. multimodal scenario um, yep. should be valuable. Um, if like why the, the graph domain should benefit from the image domain here mm -hmm. if we use something multimodal, right? Oh yeah, yeah. I'm thinking about that. Yeah, so I'm but, assuming that there can be some kind of knowledge transfer between the I okay. mean, images and, and graphs. Yeah, to me, that sounds far-fetched. But then again, right, we've also seen these papers um, pre-training on some, or these transformers pre-training on some code or something, and then performing better on some protein sequence tasks yeah. or something. Yeah, right. Great. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't know. Do you have a title of one of those papers in mind? Um, uh, titles? That, that does one of those papers come to mind for you? Because Jason mm. here, for example, has, has not heard of this crazy stuff, for example. No, okay. Oh, uh, anyway, not specifically, yeah. Uh, okay. Then no. let's, let's get to. Uh, yeah, that's your argument why having a pure transformer is, is nice. Yeah. And there are some other regions as well, which I will explain. So uh, transformers are, as we all know, very versatile architecture used in a broad class of machine learning problems, including language and vision. And recently also reinforcement learning and multimodal learning, where you just have a bunch of um, different modalities and process them with a single model. Uh, so they are versatile. And one another good thing is that because they're versatile, they come with a solid technology stack that, I mean, integrates the advances from the all those domains. For example, from uh, NLP domain, we have developed methods for, I mean, doing zero shot or few shot learning with transformers. For example, we have recently have um, prompting based future learning framework and also adapter based future learning. 
And we also have many self-supervision technologies such as masked autoencoding that's in MAE or BERT. Or we also have technology for sequence modeling based on autoregressive decoding. And one other good technology is the linearization, where you can um, use some kind of approximation techniques to uh, offload the quadratic complexity of self-attention to linear to the number of input tokens. And we also have dedicated GPU accelerators um, like LightSeq2 and flash attention that are applicable to, I mean, less modified self-attention. So we have this thing. And um, one of the reasons uh, why this kind of um, solid technology stack is available is I think um, the architecture is very simple and general. So basically transformer is uh, tokenizer and positional embedding summed with multi head self attention and fit for neural networks. So I think this, because this architecture is simple and general, it facilitates the convergence of solutions across domains and modalities. So uh, in terms of tokenizer, we can view the language and vision in the same way. So basically language is, uh, to process the language, we just tokenize the text into a set of tokens and use one dimensional positional embedding. And to process image, we just tokenize the image patches and use two, two dimensional positional embeddings. So um, the main question in this work is whether or not we can bring this paradigm into the graph line domain. But uh, for graphs, this tokenization into those is non-trivial because we have additional, I mean, irregular structure that's encoded in the edges. And we also have edge attributes. So uh, if we consider tokenizing a graph, we might we can immediately know that tokenizing into a set of nodes leads to loss of information. So this brings a challenge for graph transformers based on node self attention. And because of this reason, the prior graph transformers add some kind of architectural modifications to handle this kind of edge structure. For example, uh, we have this model called Grover that uses some auxiliary message passing GNM to generate the QKV of the self-attention. And we also have a recent graph former, which augments the self-attention using the spatial and edge encoding, which basically takes, in, takes all kinds of edge information into account. This is one way of modeling graphs with transformers. And they're actually pretty nice because they yield very nice performance in benchmarks such as PCQ and FOM. Okay, wait, but uh, yeah. we don't we don't lose the connectivity information, right? If yeah, right. We, um, the, the connectivity information we can also encode with some positional encodings, right? Mm -hmm. And that we add to our um, that we add to our node tokens. But yeah. then it's not then then it's not clear how to mm -hmm. encode the edge features, is what you're saying. Yeah, and yeah, right. most of the most of the architectures or most of the previous approaches then went ahead with doing having some message passing layers in between or yeah. with putting it into like the graph format it puts it into the uh, embeddings that creates yeah. like the um, attention coefficients of which we then take the softmax in our attention and mm -hmm. yeah but this way like right the, the reformer way for example mm -hmm. there the edge features only come in very implicitly by yeah, biasing right. our attention yeah exactly and meanwhile now you really if you tokenize the edges mm -hmm. then and the the edge tokens are really based on the edge features as well mm -hmm. then yeah, right. the edge features sort of become first class citizens again and yeah, yeah, right. Treat it as importantly as the node feature. Mm. All right. Sorry for the rant. Let's. let's okay. Go so um, I know I'm talking about a lot about scene graphs, but in in case of scene graphs, you have um edge edge features that have very important meaning, right? So in this case, um, implicitly encoding in, encoding them into edge encoding might be not sufficient. That's one of the reasons again. So uh. 
I so our belief is that this kind of modification of transform architecture for modeling graphs can be potentially be a limiting constraint due to several reasons. And the first reason is that if we introduce the message passing neural networks, they might inherit some kind of limitation of the message passing genes, uh, namely oversmoothing problem. And the second issue is that they become incom incomparable with useful engineering techniques or libraries for standard self-attention. Um, a nice example is the linear complexity self-attention. Again, this becomes not a problem if you use um, fully connected self-attention jointly with message passing neural networks. But again, we our solution here does not desire that. And the last thing is that it's kind of hard to integrate into multimodal agents. Again, this is a kind of a looking into the looking at the moon, but yeah. Wait so. a second. But so you're saying that it's um, these other methods are incompatible with useful engineering techniques for standard self-attention, where we can maybe get some one of those linear uh, linear complexity self-attention mechanisms. Uh, we could not do the linear complexity self-attention um, mm -hmm. in in the old transformers, but mm -hmm. now we can do it with your fully tokenized pure transformer. Yeah. But there we have to remember, right? Your transformer inherently has more tokens as well. Yeah, right. right. Because you tokenize every mm -hmm. edge. Yeah, right. So it's not necessarily now more mm. efficient or yeah. Mm, yeah yeah right uh so by this kind of engineering techniques um of course linear complexity is one of them and it's re kind of required for our model to be useful because our model i mean tokenizes the edges as well but there are some other things i think for example what could be the example things like the I mean, dedicated CUDA kernel. So for example, um, we have this kind of, so yeah, this kind of GPU accelerators that might not work if we introduce some kind of graph specific modifications. And okay. if you can, yeah. Nice. Mm -hmm. I, I did not know about that. I did not even think about it. Yeah. Yeah, so um, the motivation in this work is to be compatible with the entire transformer stack as possible. So uh, to, I mean, for this motivation, we try applying a standard transformer directly for graphs without introducing, I mean, any kinds of graph specific architecture modifications. We intentionally, we are intentionally, I mean, simplifying everything. So we are gonna show that this simple approach is theoretically and empirically feasible. So uh, yeah. So our theoretical guarantee is based on KIGN, and our, I mean, empirical guarantee is based on physical and parameter too. So let me proceed to the method. Uh, so in terms of applying a pure transformers to graph inputs, sorry, just. No, oh. it's just a question about KIGN. I guess we'll get to that later. Yeah, um, right. I'm going to get to that later. So. Uh, naturally, the question, this question translates to the question of how to tokenize a graph. So our intuition here is that we are going to treat both the nodes and edges as tokens. And we will assume that with appropriate token-wise information, the self-attention would be able to properly recognize and process the graph structure. And by this um, properly and recognize, I will um, establish some kind of theory later. Yeah. So based on but the intuition. Really, mm -hmm. First to make this real clear, right? Why if I now tokenize all my edges and all my uh, nodes, as mm -hmm. you have it drawn here on the bottom right, um, mm -hmm. why can't I just go ahead and now feed, um, like my, I take my node features and yeah. I put them through an MLP. I mm -hmm. take my edge features, put them through an MLP uh -huh. and then have these as my tokens that I throw into my transformer. Why would oh, that yeah. be problematic? Oh yeah, in that case, we are gonna lose uh, the structural information of which edge connects which node. So for example, we can consider a setup where there's no edge and node features and there's only connectivity. And this connectivity itself is just some kind of important information, right? 
But if we just remove the connectivity information and treat only the nodes and edges as a bag of tokens, the um, connectivity information will get lost and we will not be able to recognize a correct structure. Okay. Yeah, that's the exactly the reason we need this kind of tokenized information. Uh, I think I have a question in the chat. Are these tokens independent? They are independent in a sense that um, they are treated as independent tokens, but they're technically not independent because we'll impose some kind of relations when we design this kind of tokenized information, more specifically tokenized embeddings. We will also get to that later. How to handle the load as large degree? Uh, so if uh, the node has large degree, it has a lot of edges connected to it. We, and we are gonna just tokenize every edge connected to it into separate tokens. So we are gonna treat the N nodes and N, M edges of a graph as N plus M independent tokens. And we are gonna concatenate simple tokenized embeddings. More specifically, they are composed of um, type identifiers and node identifiers. So type identifier is just basically two learnable vectors, each of them denoting whether this token is a node or an edge. So if uh, we are gonna, if our token is a node, we are gonna um, append it for say vector A, and if the token is an edge, we are gonna append vector B. So it works like that. And the second tokenized embedding is the node identifiers. So they are basically a set of orthonormal vectors that's assigned for each node. And they're gonna be appended like this. So for each node, we are gonna just repeat each uh, node identifier. And for each edge, we are gonna just concatenate the identifier of the nodes that is linking each other. Oh, okay. And what is for example, so we just take these uh, three types of ident or these three identifiers and concatenate them, right? Yeah, right. Um, but if we have a node uh, or each node is as associated with a node identifier, and mm -hmm. then if we have a node, it gets two times the node identifier. But if we have an edge, then it gets the, the node identifier of the one node it's connected yeah. to and the node identifier of the other node. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and now we have all of these tokens. But what what can the node identifiers be? Is that like, for example, Laplacian positional encoding? Yeah, right, exactly. Uh, oh. We have, I mean, the only condition imposed on the node identifier is that they need to be also also normal, and we have no other conditions. Yeah, so they are fine as, to, as long as they are also normal. And based on this tokenization, after that, we are just gonna fit everything to a standard transform encoder. So Dom is raising his hand. What what yeah. point do we? Um, I have a few questions. Like in in the chat, uh, for example, okay. there's a question about why the um, node embedding is repeated twice for nodes, and mm -hmm. I suspect this is to maintain the same size across every node, right? Yeah, so one reason is that we need to maintain the size of the embedding so that we can use the same, I mean, linear embedding for both of course the node and edges. So basically we are we want to treat everything as uh, unified tokens. So that's one reason we are repeating this. And the second yeah. reason is that when we get to the theory, um, in the theory, uh, let me explain this after we get the theory, yeah. So yeah. one reason is that we just, be the same dimensions. Okay, and uh, if you have, for example, a, a self loop in your graph, yeah. I mean, this is a very basic stuff, but if you have a self loop, uh -huh. the edge embedding will be the same as the node embedding, except for yeah. the V or E token. Yeah, so, right. Okay. Yeah, um, uh, to, but to adhere to the theory, I think a better way is just to have the node embedding and concatenate the somehow concatenate the feature of the node and the feature of the self loop. Okay. Yeah. And uh, here, like, if you have the node embedding, uh, what happens many times is that uh, mm -hmm. there is a lot more node information than there is edge information. 
Um, yeah. So how do you how do you cope with that? Like, do you simply pad the edge to be yeah. the same size as the as the nodes? Oh, so when the dimensionality of the node edges are different? Yeah, because I mean, usually the attributes. node embedding is a, a lot larger than the mm, edge. Yeah, yeah, right. So uh, there can be several solutions. A very simple solution is just to use, for example, if we, if our node attributes are D1 dimensional and edge attributes are D2 dimensional, we're gonna just use D1 plus D2 dimensional embeddings. And if this is a node, we can just put the attributes in the first D1 channels. And if this is an edge, we are gonna put the attributes in the last D2 channels. So okay. by that we can, yeah, we can use the same number of channels for nodes and edges. Okay, so, okay, thank you. Yeah, so the attributes correspond to this. Uh, can I, can I show something? Oh, can you see my cursor here? Yeah, we see your cursor. Okay, so basically attributes correspond to this thing. So we have all the identifiers. In addition, we also have the attributes here. So basically this model is seeing both the attributes and the node and type identifiers that uh, specify the information on the graph structure. Yeah, so how does this work? I mean, um, let me provide some intuition on how this works to interpret the graph structure. So basically uh, what's important is the actually the node identifiers. Because for type and identifiers, if you just use an NLP, you can immediately know that this is a node or edge by comparing these two, right? So basically the important thing is node identifiers. And um, the idea is that comparing the node identifiers of a pair of tokens reveals their incidence information. So incidence is a bit of a different concept from adjacency. So basically in this incidence um, cares whether or not these two tokens are directly connected in the graph. And in turn, this allows the self-attention mechanism to identify and exploit the graph structure. Let me give an example. So for example, these two tokens are incident pairs on the graph. And as a consequence, they have repeated, I mean, common node identifiers. And as a result, in the self-attention mechanism, their dot product becomes one. As another example, these two tokens are known incident pairs on the graph. And consequently, they have no common node identifiers. And as a result, their top product is zero. So although these tokens are seemingly independent, their affinity in the top product is not, I mean, independent. And they indeed encode some kind of structure of the graph. Wait, so, so don't yeah. you feed this into an MLP before you take the inner product? Uh, Actually, our proof um, already works if you immediately feed these tokens into the encoder. Yeah, 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 but that's not that. Do you actually do that in your transformer? You yeah, I it? actually do that. We actually okay, do so that in our physical form experiment. So you don't generate, um, you don't put the, this concatenated vector mm -hmm. through an MLP. Yeah. Well, but the concatenated thing, right? You mm -hmm. then still, um, uh, you still don't want to multiply your. I mean, you also have the the learned v and e included here, so the inner, so the dot product will not be zero, right? Uh oh yeah yeah right yeah right. So, so just, Hannes, just... I think uh, I, I think here like it means even if you add an MLP, uh -huh. it's it means that there's a trivial, very trivial function that allows you to retrieve the connectivity. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. sure. Oh, okay, sure. But um, it is just it's it's not true, right? That the dot product of these vectors will be zero. Uh, say again. Okay. It is not true that the dot product of these vectors will be zero. Oh, you but mean we... you mean in the actual model, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, right. So um, it, what, what I'm saying here is that uh, that product indeed reveals the structure of the graph. 
And in the proof, although the data product might not be zero if we learn some random, I mean, embeddings of the input, in the proof, we are going to exploit this property to reduce the transform into a KIJ. Yeah, I, I just have doubts um, mm -hmm. uh, that this is actually important for the final empirical performance that these oh, node yeah. identifiers are orthonormal. Mm -hmm. But okay, it's uh, it's now good for you to analyze your mm -hmm. um, network theoretically. If these oh, settings yeah. are orthonormal, mm -hmm. then we can make some statements uh, mm -hmm. comparing to a KIGN. Yeah, That's yeah, right. right. Okay. Yeah, I think empirically the network can rely on other features like, I mean, attributes. So they are, I mean, that, that product is not necessarily zero. And indeed in our analysis on the, I mean, network attention distance, it seems that the network indeed leverages the attributes to learn, I mean, some kind of more diverse attention patterns. Yeah. So yeah, this is um, kind of theoretical. And I also have a question in the chat. Oh yeah, uh, this is a good question. So because this is a concatenation and that's some kind of invariant pooling, we need to decide the order of the node identifiers. So to treat on undirected graph, we simply put both tokens. So if the node three and node four are connected, mm -hmm. we are gonna use both three to four connection as an edge. And we are gonna also use four to three connection to an edge. So we're gonna have two edge tokens here. So let me move on. Yeah, so for the node identifiers, the only requirement, I mean, theoretically, is to be in orthonormal. So in our work, we are going to exper experiment two things, two choices. Uh, so the first one is that the orthogonal random features that's generated by QR decomposing a random Gaussian matrix. This is a uh, typically used in performer, I mean, transformers. And the second choice is the Laplacian eigenvectors that's obtained by eigen decomposing the graph Laplacian matrix. Okay. So um, these two are very simple choices, but they are, I mean, they have very different implications. So the orthogonal random features, they do not encode any information about the graph. So they are completely, ran completely random. And the only property they have is that um, each feature is orthogonal. But for the Laplacian eigenvectors, we do have some kind of inf encoded information about the graph. So they are already widely used for graph positional embeddings. And for the type identifiers, they are only required to be trainable. So we simply have two trainable vectors and append one for all nodes and append the other for all edges. And one notable thing here is that these type identifiers are agnostic, agnostic to the nodes or number of the nodes. Yeah, so uh, this is pretty much everything about the method. And let me provide an overview of the theory. So uh, our theory basically suggests that given these token-wise embeddings, self attention on these tokens can approximate all, I mean, possible equivalent linear basis operations on graphs that was identified in this work, invariant and equivalent graph networks. So in turn, they are guaranteed, I mean, in terms of expressiveness, they are guaranteed to be more expressive than message passing your neural networks. Yep, so based on that, uh, our model is theoretically at least as expressive as two IGN and consequently two WL, second order WA graphics more present test and is more expressive than all message passing graph neural networks. And actually that theory naturally extends to order K models, I mean, for hypergraphs. And the extension is very simply done by concatenating the node ident K node identifiers for each K edge. And as a result, we can show that they are at least as expressive as K expressive as KIG and KWL prep is more present test. Um, sorry, uh, here I would like to know like uh, yep. what is, uh, so the token that you add makes it more expressive than all message passing GNNs. Mm. Uh, but like uh, if you add these same tokens, for example, to a message passing GNN, mm -hmm. um, 
is the expressivity the same? Is it higher or is it something that you, you have not explored yet? Uh, you mean adding the edge tokens to a message question gen? Yeah, sure. Because because oh. here what um, what what it shows is that with the tokens, which is a form of positional encoding, mm -hmm. uh, you can have higher expressivity uh, yep. for for the transformer. But uh, with adding the same token to a message passing, also give you mm -hmm. this uh, same increased expressivity. Uh, it's it's a little bit tricky because um, the reason that this network in turn becomes more expressive than message passing gen is because it contains some kind of non-local operations. So because we um, impose self potential and self potential is not restricted, they can model non-local interactions where you can attend from a very distant node to any other nodes or edges on the graph. So that's one of the reasons this network is more expressive than message passing. So uh, it's a little bit tricky because even if you add the edge tokens to the message passing, it's still a local operation, right? Yeah, it's still a, a local yeah. operation, but it's uh, it definitely makes it more powerful than 2WL, which is also a local local expressivity test. Oh, yeah. I think that's possible. So here we are considering some uh, first order message passing algorithm here. Yeah. OK. OK. Yeah, but so isn't it true that if we take a transformer, mm -hmm. we only tokenize the nodes and we throw Laplacian positional encoding onto the nodes, yeah. then all of the expressiveness results also hold that you have here? Uh, sorry? So, so isn't the expressiveness of your model yeah. the same as a node level a node transformer which yeah. has Laplacian positional encoding added to the nodes. You you mean relative positional encodings? La, no, I mean Laplacian. Uh, Laplacian embeddings. Yes. So uh, to to answer that, I need to know the expressiveness of the Laplacian positional embeddings. Um, but I'm not. Dom, do you have any insights on that? Okay, okay can so, you uh, repeat the question quickly? I think I might have, but I missed a part of the question. If we have a node level transformer, so, so a, a transformer yeah. that only tokenizes the nodes, mm -hmm. and then we add Laplacian, Laplacian positional encoding to the nodes, mm -hmm. and then we throw that into a transformer. Isn't the expressiveness of that model the same as the model that we have here? Yeah. Well, if you um, if you don't consider edge features, so you take any graph that doesn't have edge features, then just featureizing the node and running a transformer on the nodes uh, should be a universal sequence to sequence transformer. Yeah. Uh, although it suffers from the fact that uh, there's sign permutation uh, with the with the eigenvectors, but other than that, uh, if you feed the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues, not just the eigenvectors, mm -hmm. uh, you should uh, be universal sequence to sequence transformer. Uh, now, if you want to be universal graph to graph transformer, you need to have the edge feature somewhere, uh, either like in the attention, like uh, like has been done in Graphformer and Sun and or um, in any other way, like, uh, the, yeah, but you, you need edge information in some sense. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, okay, I get the point now, yeah. Okay, so I so have, there's uh, a question from yeah. Fabrizio, um, you can go ahead. Hi, uh, thanks. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so I think Dominic's question was actually interesting, like when he was saying, if you use the same encoding with an MPNN, mm -hmm. wouldn't you get a probably powerful architecture as well? I think that's the case. I mean, because it's been proved that if you use unique node identifiers, MPNNs can be, if they're sufficiently deep and wide, they can be a universal 
graph uh, function approximators, right? So, yeah, it's um, yeah. yeah. I don't really understand where the the expressive power comes from in your in your approach. Uh, um, also, like when when you say it it comes from the fact that you have global operations. What what do you think is the case in particular? Like, why is that? Uh, okay, so um, the expressiveness here. I mean, uh, let me organize my thoughts for just a minute. Okay, so I think there is a some kind of drawback in both the local models, I mean, a model that can do only the local operations and a model that can only do global operations. So for example, let's consider a global model um, that's not aware of the local structures of the graph. And apparently, although this model can do non-local operations, its expressiveness might not be very high because um, it's not aware of the local graph structures. And in case of a local model, like message passing neural networks, um, although it can go very deep and, I mean, although it can, if each depth is sufficiently deep so that it can model all non-local operations, it's expressive. In some real, realistic scenarios, um, they suffer from, I mean, the lack of global operations, right? I, I think that's an observation like, from the- Do you have a- like, do you have a reference for which, which says that like, is the lack of global operations that, uh, you know, is detrimental in terms of expressive power for for MPNN? Because I, mm. I wasn't really aware of this. It's, okay. Uh, uh, I mean, I I know that you know, yeah. because you know, for example, mm. um, I'm not sure if this is actually well studied. It might be the case, but. Uh, yeah. You know, in this higher order GNNs, okay, typically they are global. Mm -hmm. uh, but for example, there are new works from uh, Chris Morris where yep. uh, he essentially uses uh, local operations. Mm -hmm. um, there's a whole theory is building up upon this. So still not 100% sure about, um, you know, where and how global mm -hmm. operations would have an impact on expressive power. Okay, so uh, in terms asking. of theory, I think um, I, I do not, remember the exact title, but one of the works uh, showed that if you add global attention to a message passing neural network, then it becomes um, as expressive as some, some kind of very strong, I mean, it's some graph based on prison test. I'm gonna search up for it after the end of the presentation. And theoretically there is some work. And empirically, um, I think there's a lot of work on adding virtual node to a graph so that plain message passing can model the global interactions. And empirically, it's, it's kind of known that adding this kind of virtual load to model the global interactions results in enhanced performance overall. I understand, but these are two different things. So one thing is saying this model is more expressive and expressive mm -hmm. power. I mean, it's, it, it has more expressive power because it can distinguish yeah. graph pairs that the another model cannot mm -hmm. while still distinguishing all graph pairs, the other model can. Yep. Another thing is saying in, in practice, it performs well. I mean, in practice, it performs well. It means that for that particular task, uh, the model seems to generalize better. It's mm -hmm. a completely different thing for different oh, yeah, reasons. Yeah, one yeah. reason is that one, in one case, we're talking about mm -hmm. discriminative power. In another case, we're talking about the ability of the model to somehow generalize in a specific data set. It's, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a bit different. Um, but anyway, I mean, I don't want to hijack the, mm -hmm. the meeting. Thanks for, for the question. We can maybe follow up later. Um, okay. So uh, I'll try to remember the work that, I mean, on the expressiveness of the global interactions. I'll try to remember that. Um, it's also, but, but again, like I think yeah. uh, this connection so the fact that you use, uh, other than this, the fact that you use unique node identifiers, mm -hmm. I think it's something that you need to um, really com consider in comparison with this approach, which use, approaches which use 
uh, unique node identifiers for NPNNs because mm, yeah. they claim they can get universal. Yeah. So I mean, it's you mean theoretically or with that thing. theoretically or empirically? Theoretically, yes. Ah, okay. So there's, for example, there's a work from Andreas Lucas. Mm. I don't know if you know about him, but mm. I mean, for example, yeah, in that case, it shows that you need that certain mm -hmm. depth and width. In that yep. case, if you have unique node identifiers yep. and other, um, you know, particular. Mm -hmm. uh, choices, then you can be, you know, a GNN can be Turing complete. Yeah. Um, right. So I think it's, it will be important for yeah. uh, to, to compare with these approaches in general. Yeah, so I just wanted to drop this here. In, in high level, uh, I roughly think our approach can generalize the findings in those methods where you equip the, I mean, message passing neural networks with uh, unique node identifiers. I mean, in our theory, we only use the node identifiers to compute, um, I mean, send the, the, that product to, to zero or one. So we are, I mean, not explicitly utilizing the uniqueness of the node identifiers. Uh, but one, I mean, one result of our theory is that com by composing two transformer layers, we can approximate the message passing layer. And because our model has unique node identifiers as input and two transformer layers can approximate message passing genes. So our method can basically reduce to all these message passing genes with unique node identifiers. So I think that implies that uh, the theoretical findings on this kind of message passing genes can translate to our model indeed. Yeah, yeah, I think so actually. Yeah. Um, that, that's, why, that's why in general, mm -hmm probably might be even more useful to mm -hmm. directly go and, and see where in which like you know under which condition your model is already universal because if you use mm -hmm. node identifiers yeah it might just be the case for a certain depth and width mm -hmm. rather than comparing with a certain kwl yep. um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I yeah, think, I think yeah i yeah. i think that makes sense i mean um from until now i only considered our model in terms of aligning to the WL hierarchy, but by somehow leveraging the uniqueness of the node identifiers, it might be possible that our model is a universal approximator. And that's a good thing, maybe. And thank you for pointing that out. Um, related to this, because I, also, I think also there's a question in the chat, which might oh, yeah. be seen. So just to understand, when you use um, unique, unique node identifiers, mm -hmm. What's the, like, what, what about um, permutation equivariant or invariant? Like, yeah. does, this, does the output of the model depend on the choice of, for example, the, the, the order of the nodes? I think this is an uh, interesting uh, question. I, I couldn't really get it. Uh, I think so it depends on the choice of the node identifiers. For, so because it only requires to be orthonormal, for example, you could choose some, some kind of algorithm that depends on the ordering of the nodes, right? So they are also normal, but it could depend on the ordering of the nodes. In that case, in practice, the model might not be permutation equivalent. But for other node identif identifiers, um, namely the Laplacian eigenvectors, the Laplacian eigenvectors are indeed invariant to the permutation of the nodes. And in that case, I think the output of the model will permute accordingly to the choice of the node permutation of the input. So in short, it depends on the choice of the node identifiers. But in the model that you use in the end, yep. in your experiments, for example, okay. there it is not, uh, there we are permutation equivariant. Oh, so in the final experiments, I mainly use yes. ORF and Laplacian. So for the ORF, they are completely random. So there is already a stochastic in the prediction. For, for Laplacian eigenvectors, they are indeed permutation equivalent to the input. Um, does this answer your question? This um, invariant even when you use, or equivalent even when you use one of the encodings for nodes and, yeah, for nodes? One of the encodings? Well, um, how do you generate the one of the encoding? No, I mean, like, you, you, okay, you remember the, the, the figure from the previous slide where you had like one, two, three, four, okay, so I, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Had, yeah. In, in the case, no. I think that yeah. depends on your choice of the, I mean, label orders. Okay. 
Yep. Okay. So that would make it permutation sensitive. Okay. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Nice. Um, okay. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I need to introduce a little bit of background on the theory of KIGN. So basically, uh, our theory relies on the tensor representation of these sets, graphs and hypergraphs. And from this representation, we are going to derive um, the equivalent linear layers for high order tensors and consequently KIGN, on which we build our theory of expressive power of this potential. So, yep. Background. <laughs> so uh, while we are considering the graph structure data, that's, I mean, practically sparse, uh, if we consider them as second order relational data, we can encode them into some kind of second order matrix. For example, we can, I mean, encode the sparse structure of the graphs into adjacent symmetrics. And if the graph is equipped with some kind of edge features, we, then we can add a feature dimension to add I mean, obtain second of the tensors with feature dimension. So basically we are, we have encoded the graphs into a second order tensor that's permutable. And we are gonna work on this kind of permutable tensors. So this is an example for graphs. And if we consider such without the edges, we can consider them as first order data that's just encoded into a feature matrix. And if we generalize to high order, we have hypergraphs that um, encode high order interactions in in the form of like third order tensor if you consider for example mesh structural data and in general if we have k edges in our data that can be encoded into order k tensor possibly with feature dimension so uh, this kind of high order tensor representation provides a unification for such graphs and hypergraphs uh, there's a question in the chat oh yeah um the adjacency does not contain all the information of the graph, but if we can, I mean, appropriately augment this, to, I mean, augment this tensor so that it indeed contains all the information on the graph. So for example, we can place the node features on the diagonals and place the edge features in the non diagonals so that um, it, I mean, it contains both the adjacency and it al also contains the attributes of the graph. So uh, having defined our I mean, data in the form of tensors, um, in terms of neural networks, we typically design them as multi-layer perceptrons, right? So they, they are alternation of the linear layers and no linearity. So the question of designing the um, neural networks for tensors reduces to the question of designing the linear layers for the tensors. And uh, one important consideration here is that Sorry, uh, I have a question in the chat. Oh yeah, so in the, uh, to account for this parsity, we can, I mean, place the adjacency matrix at the first channel and contain the attributes at the last, I mean, other channels. So that if you are interpreting the second order tensor, you will first look at the first channel and see if this, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so uh, the isomorphism invariance of the graphs translate into the permutation invariants of the tensor. So for example, if you um, change the labels of the first and second nodes here, then it will accordingly change the, our choice of the tensor representation based on the node permutation. So uh, a well-known solution for this is just to um, introduce some kind of permutation equivalent functions that expect this kind of permutation symmetry by construction. So uh, on a very simple example is just the FFN in transformers. And a little bit more complex example is the permutation equivalent MLP, which is just very similar to the KIGN I'm talking about. So uh, in this network, we are gonna use the equivalent linear layer and use that, code, I mean, with the pointwise nonlinearity here. So uh, it's, I mean, conveniently, it's known that this kind of maximally expressive equivalent linear layer is, can be constructed like exactly like this equation, which is just a composition of the weight application and bias addition. 
So for the output, uh, we have the output tensor, which is an order L tensor. And we are going to index each of the out output entry using an L tuple of the indices. And for the weight, we have some kind of outer summation of our symbol mu's, and we are going to call the uh, symbol mu's as equivalence classes. Uh, you don't need to know exactly about this in this presentation. And for in, inside that, we have the inner summation of our the input entries. And more specifically, this in, inner summation of the input entries is mask summation. And this mask is basically basis tensor entry, which is binary, it's either zero or one. And it's um, augmented with the weight matrix, which is the learnable, actually learnable parameter. And this basis tensor is structured based on the equivalence class. I mean, the structure of the equivalence class. So uh, in a nutshell, the weight application is uh, summation of a view, and each view dictates the how the input entries are summated based on each I mean, intrinsic, um, intrinsic property. So a uh, similar thing happens for the bias. So it also has the basis tensor and it also has the learnable vector. And it's kind of known that um, for the weight application, we have the um, K plus else bell number of the equivalence classes. And for the bias, we have else bell number equivalence classes. Yeah, so this is the permutation equivalent linear layer that, I mean, construct the KIGN. Uh, so let me provide the very simple example, which is just the first order linear layer. And first, by first order, I'm referring to the set. And because this is a linear layer for set, it's completely same with the deep set layer. And for the deep set layer, we have two equivalence classes for the weight and a single equivalence class for the bias. And the um, two equivalence classes for the weight parameterize a very simple function. So we have two, I mean, um, basis tensor applications here. The first one is just an identity metric. So you're basically um, applying some kind of element-wise linear mapping to the input entries. And the second uh, basis tensor is some kind of pooling operation that pulls the, I mean, some pulls the representation of other entries other than oneself and then applying some kind of linear mapping here. Yeah, so the, this is the um, linear la equivalent linear layer for set. And then when we get to the second order, there are some more interactions. So now we are considering the second order data, which is just graph. And we have 15 equivalence classes for the weight, meaning that we have 15 distinct type of interactions on the graph. And we have two equivalence classes for the bias, which is just node and edges. Yeah, so uh, intuitively, each of these uh, 15 equivalence classes leads to characteristic interactions on the graph, which include both the local operations and the global operations, and the operations that involve edge to node or node to node, edge to node or node to edge interactions. So, uh, our next, I mean, our main theory is just using the transformer to approximate all the kinds of the diverse interactions on the graph that permit, I mean, that compose the KI gen. So let me provide a simple intuition on how we do this in our theory. So uh, let me write out the order K equivalent linear layer again. And I, I am omitting the bias here for simplicity. And let me write the familiar multi head cell potential layer here, which is just a summation overhead. And each head does some kind of um, dynamic attentive interactions on the input. So uh, I'm going to draw a very simple intuitive connection between these two equations. So that's just this. Um, so I am connecting the outer summation of our equivalence classes with the summation of our heads. And I'm connecting the, this equivalent basis tensor with the attention matrix. And I am connecting the uh, weight parameter that's assigned to each equivalence class to the value and output projections in the transform layer. So our key intuition, I mean, our intuition for the approximation is that the head-wise cell potential is kind of analogous to the mask sum using the one of the basis tensors that correspond to a single equivalence class. 
of course, up to normalization because uh, the basic tensor is binary and the attention tensor is normalized with the soft maths. So uh, based on the intuition, our approximation is, I mean, our strategy for approximation is just to set the number of heads, same to the number of equivalence classes. And we are gonna use each self attention head to approximate the each normalized equivalence basis tensor. So we are gonna just make the alpha H here, same to the B mu here. That's how we approximate the um, K agent using our transform. Is there any questions up to here? How, how does the number of equivalence classes grow with the order of interactions you consider? Oh yeah, so uh, if we are considering order K eigen, then there are two K bell number of the equivalence classes. So for, until up to graphs, they are manageable. So for graphs, we have 15 equivalence classes, which means we need 15 attention heads. I mean, they are manageable, but from the order three, they get quickly intractable. So for order three, for example, mesh, we need like 200 attention I mean, heads to approximate, I mean, across to approximate the KI gen here. I see. Yeah. So, so that's a problem. Mm -hmm. Sorry, is, is it fair to say then, uh, like this uh, pure transformer architecture is kind of realistic or like practically relevant for uh, normal graphs, but not for hypergraphs? Uh, oh, um, if we want this theory to hold, uh, I don't know yeah. if this is like in nice. in this. I mean, in this vanilla form of our theory, it's kind of not very tractable, I guess. But if we impose some kind of appropriate um assumptions, for example, we could assume that the hyper edges are undirected. And additionally, we could assume that uh, this, this is a, this is observation from, from our other work that's published in ECCV. So I, I'll not go deep into that, but in high level, if we um, introduce some appropriate assumption into the structure of the hypergraph, then we can make this um, computationally tractable. But in our specific theoretical framework here, it's true that um, the net model is kind of not realistic for K that's larger than two. Yeah, thank yep. you. Yep, so, uh, so to give an example, let me just reduce to the first order equivalent layer. So what, what we are gonna do here is that we are gonna bring two attention heads with attention coefficient alpha one and alpha two and use them to accurately approximate the, each of the basis tensor here. So uh, the, let, me, let me begin with the first basis tensor, which is just identity matrix. To do this, we are gonna bring n also normal vectors, which is just the node identifiers that we talked about. And we are gonna augment the input uh, by just concatenation. And after that, we are gonna use the query and key projections to select only the P and scale it with, using, scale it with the appropriate positive um, coefficient here so that the query and key are both just the scaled version of the orthonormal node identifiers. And next, we simply have um, softmax. Um, we have softmax here, and it's just softmax of the identity, identity matrix scaled by A. And lastly, we can simply send A to infinity by I mean, scaling up the query and key projections. And as a result, we have that the attention matrix here approaches the uh, identity matrix, which is basically the first basis tensor here. So by this way, we can, op I mean, use a single attention head to approximate the first basis tensor. So uh, do we have any question here? Or I can move to the second one. Okay, so for the second one, we are gonna use the same input. This is important. We are gonna use the identical input but we are gonna use some alternative query and key projections so that the dot product now becomes um, appropriate to model this second matrix. More, exact, um, more precisely, we are gonna flip the sign of the key projection so that now the query is uh, just scaled dot identifier with, the, with some positive, but now key is the scaled dot identifier with the, some kind of negative number. And as a result, we have um, the softmax, but now the matrix inside softmax is the 
some kind of negative um, identity matrix. And now by sending the A to infinity, we have the normalized version of the second, uh, second basis tensor. So in this way, we can use the same input for the both attention heads, and we can only adjust the quarian key projections so that the attention matrix parameterized, I mean, attention matrix reduces to the, each of the distinct uh, equivalent basis tensors. Um, so if I understand correctly, this is, yep. Uh, this kind of a careful construction that yeah, shows yeah, right. that you can approximate. But if you run this in practice, uh, oh yeah, right. Would you get something similar to like actually reconstructing this or like? Oh yeah, is uh, it even identifiable? Like it. Uh, uh, I mean, it's kind of hard to identify. And in in our experiment, we indeed um try to analyze the structure of the learned attention, and it seems yeah. that. Yeah, so in this case, one of the basis tensor is kind of local interaction, then the another is the global interaction, right? And in this specific construction, we are assigning each head to explicitly model one of these interactions. But in practice, they are not constrained, so they can learn whatever they want. And as a result, as we will show in the later experiments, the lower layers tend to, I mean, learn some kind of local interactions that's specifically more close to certain equivalent classes and the upper layers tend to learn some global interactions that's close to other equivalent classes so in in practice this is kind of mixed do you have these attention visualizations also in your slides here oh uh, i have some visualizations for synthetic experiments but they are designed specifically for de demonstrating this theory uh, and i don't exactly have the attention metrics for real world scenario. Yeah. Data. Okay, so the more, I mean, the takeaway message here is that we can just fix the input with some appropriate side information. And we can just, I mean, carefully construct the query and key projections so that the top product becomes each equivalence class. We are gonna apply the exactly same logic for the order K case. So in case of the order K equivalent layer, we are gonna use um, two case bell number of heads. And we are gonna to try to approximate the full equivalent basis, which involves this number of the attention tensors, I mean, basis tensors. And for this, we have some proof in the paper. And we, for this, we are gonna construct using the node identifiers and type identifiers. Uh, this is very similar to the node and I mean, edge identifier that we discussed in our graph terms, I mean, second order model. So in this case, we are gonna augment each input token using the concatenation of the K node identifiers that compose it K edge. And we are gonna additionally attach some kind of type, type identifier that specifies um, the type of this hyper edge. And after that, we are gonna share this input in all the head, all the attention heads, and we are gonna show that, uh, we show that by carefully constructing the query and key projections, the dot product can, I mean, consequently model all kinds of the equivalent basis tensors that are requ required to, I mean, construct the order K equivalent layer. So this is um, how, how our theory works. So uh, by just simply taking K equal to two, this entire model reduces to the second order case with 15 attention heads, which gives the token GT for graphs as in our experiment. Yep, so this entire theory gives us some ni nice lemma and corollaries. So the, our first lemma is that by having this kind of um, node and type identifiers for generalized order K case, which, uh, we can construct the self attention coefficient so that it can approximate any basis tensor of the order K equivalent linear layer up to normalization. And this does not depend on the input. And as a result, by composing the bell number of heads, we can show that uh, the pure transformer operating on the, I mean, augmented input can approximate an order K equivalent linear layer to an arbitrary precision. I will question in the chat. Can you, yes. should I read it? Do you want to read it? 
Oh, I, I'm reading it. So uh, the question is that should, okay. Uh, so the question is that if our token GT, say um, our token GT is approximating a KIGM, and should it be permutation equivalent or invariant? And I think the answer is yes. If it, I mean, if it uh, kind of approximates the, I mean, KIGN, because the definition of KIGN involves the permutation equivalence and invariance. Uh, but in case that token GT is not approximating a KIGN and it's approximating some kind of other functions, I think it can reduce to some known permutation equivalent function. It, it depends on the choice of node identifiers, but and does the quality ability to uh, may I ask for a clarification of the second question here? Well, Fabrizio, do you want to, to clarify and unmute it or not? Uh, the second question. Oh. Well, but you, with the second question, you mean does the ability to be equi uh, invariant? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, that, that one. Yep. Um, you know, I, I, so it doesn't, right? the um we don't we uh, our token gt is mm -hmm. completely equivalent if the um positional encodings that we use are equivalent yeah right i think so so um it's equivalent as long as the Positional embedding, I mean, node identifier that we, we are using is equivalent to the permutation. If it's not, for example, if we are using some kind of one-up vectors, then it can reduce to some, I mean, it can converge to non-equivalent solutions. But if our model approximates the KIGN, no matter what kind of um, node identifier we use, it is indeed permutation equivalent and invariant because it's only utilizing the top product of the identifiers and not exactly utilizing the known equivalence. Yeah, I think that answers the question. Okay. Uh, if not, then Fabrizio will surely uh, clarify. Mm -hmm. so. All right, so uh, moving on. So, um, so far we talked about the approximation of a single layer. And what immediately follows is that if we compose T layers of this kind of um, pure, pure transforms, and if we additionally add some sampling and MAP, we can prove that this can approximate on KI gen, I mean, any KI gen to an arbitrary precision. That's our second story. And um, based on this, we can just take the any kind of theoretical results on the expressiveness of KIGN and just use them to lower bound the expressive power of our model. So for example, we can argue that a transformers on node and type identifiers is at least as expressive as KIGN. And we can also argue that the transformer on node and type identifier is at least as powerful as um, the KWF isomorphism test and more expressive than message passing neural networks that's under, I mean, specific parameterization of the Gilmore at L 2017. So uh, this is the pretty much of our theory. So let's move to the experiment. So um, our first experiment is explicitly showing that with the node and type identifiers, the 15 attention heads can jointly learn, I mean, each of the equivalent basis tensor. So to do this, we organize us, I mean, rather small data set of composed of the synthetic um, BA graphs. And we use a single transform layer and explicitly supervise each of the 15 attention heads 
to learn each of the equivalent basis tensor. So we are imposing the explicit supervision here. And um, based on the L2 error, we are going to see if this model is able to converge to the equivalent basis tensor or not. And our result shows that the approximation can become accurate only when we use both the also normal type, I mean, also normal load identifiers along with the type identifiers. If we don't use either of them, the approximation gets really I mean, inaccurate. That's the first observation. And the second observation is that if we use orthogonal random features, but if we assign the orthogonal random features to each token, not each node, the model still cannot, I mean, approximate the equivalent basis. This implies that the incidence information provided by the concatenation of the node identifiers is indeed important for modeling the graph structure as our theory suggests. But is the um, concatenation of the yeah. edge identifiers also important? Like, uh, I mean, we could distinguish node tokens yeah. from edge tokens simply by looking yeah. if they have the same thing concatenated or not, right? So oh, yeah. why do we need the, the nodes? Uh, why do we need the edge or nodes mm -hmm. identifiers or whatever you call them? Oh, you mean the type identifiers, right? The type identifiers, yes. Oh, yeah. I mean, as you mentioned, if we use a single MLP after the concatenated node identifiers, then we can just implicitly learn the type identifiers. So um, the type identifiers are required because the layer is a single layer, because we are considering a single layer without the MLP. So in that case, um, the self potential itself cannot distinguish between the nodes and edges in certain okay. cases. Yeah, so that, I mean, yeah, that's a little bit of tricky part, but in theory, we need these type identifiers. Yeah. But yeah, in practice, you don't need to care about it because the node and edge attributes already implicitly encode the type identifiers, so. Yeah, the, there's the extreme case where uh, mm -hmm. there are self loops also that can be present. And in that case, they, uh, the edge of the self loop would be the same as, uh, would have the same embedding as it would. Oh, yeah. But in many cases, we don't care really about self loops. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. So uh, this is some extended visualization involving both the dense input. I mean, the dense input meaning the n by n dense tensors and also the sparse inputs where we just um, discard most of the edges and, and only leave the connected ones. So uh, in both cases, you can see that only when we use both the orthonormal load identifiers and type identifiers, um, there is this acute approximation of the equivalence basis happens. So basically, um, the accurate approximation happens only in the rightmost two panels, ORF and LAP. And in all other cases, there is some kind of wrong approximations, meaning that even if we explicitly supervise the model to learn specific graph operation, it cannot reduce to that operation, basically. So yeah, this synthetic experiment directly verifies our claims in our old theorems. And but they are synthetic. So we tried to demonstrate this model in a very large scale training because I mean, apparently because our model contains no inductive bias suited for graph processing. So as such data said, we chose physical and friendly to which contains more than 3 billion molecular graphs. And the first thing seeing we experimented is um, a standard transform that operates on the and edge tokens without any kind of identifiers to specify the structure of the graph. So this model essentially looks at the backup features of the nodes and edges, and it cannot recognize the graph structure. And as you can see in the table, it yields very low performance, meaning that yeah, only seeing the nodes and edge token is not enough. And our second model is um, with the tokenized embeddings, I mean, both the node and type identifiers. But in this case, for the node identifiers, we use the also normal random features. So each time the model I mean, performs the forward pass, we just um, resample the ran I mean, random embeddings for the each node. And so, I mean, this is quite, kind of surprising because surprisingly, it significantly outperforms all GNNs. And this is kind of surprising yeah. because 
the autonomous random features encodes no information about the verbs. So it's basically just um, tells which node token and edge token is proximal to each other. And somehow the network seems to able to leverage the information to um, get a better performance than the message passing. But device. it's not really surprising to us, right? right. In the sense that it, um, we know or we've always seen that graph transformers perform better on this, yeah. on this large scale data set. Yeah. Uh, which has, I don't know, 3 million graphs or something. Yep. Um, uh, yeah, there the transformers always perform better than the, the message passing architectures. In that case, uh, I guess the explicit information on the graph structure, for example, shortest space, I mean, shortest distance embeddings are provided to the model, right? For example, in graph um, you provide the model with, I mean, SPD based spatial encoding which is some kind of a more fine-grained information than just the auto JSON symmetrics, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So in that case, they are provided with a very strong encoding of the graph structure. But in this case, the only thing we have is the autonomous vectors, some random autonomous vectors. That's, I mean, tells which edge is connected to which node. And somehow the network is leveraging this information correctly. Yeah, okay, no, I, I get the point. Yep. So uh, we then changed our node identifiers to Laplace and eigenvectors. And um, it still outperforms the genus and it becomes somewhat, I mean, it's a little bit worse, but somewhat compared to the transformers that uses stronger graph specific modifications, such as the spatial encoding of graph formers. By the way, around yep. what is the like um, standard deviation for models like DCN, GIN on this data set? Oh. Like, or do you, are there any papers where they have standard deviations for PCP and for M? Actually, I took the scores for the message passing baselines from the original, I mean, paper for the OGB. So, and in the paper, they had no standard deviation. Okay, so, so Hannes, uh, one uh, one of the reasons there's no standard deviation reported yeah. is that it's very very low. Yeah, um, that's what I wanted we, to know. Yeah, yeah so guess... in uh, in our experience with uh, this large data set, like yeah. uh, it's very reproducible. The results are very reproducible. Yeah, I mean that's the thing with a super large data set, right? Uh, yeah, okay. I, I wasn't define that as super large, but yeah, compared to other graph neural networks. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm sure. also not sure whether this is a super large data set be, because this is even smaller than the image network of the right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. Uh, I mean, compared to our Tox 21 and the BB, B, BBBP hmm. data set, these are yeah. much larger. Yeah, so this is kind of the only choice that we could choose mm -hmm. to demonstrate the model. So um, I, I have a few questions here. Like yeah. uh, here, what what is transformer? Like, does oh. it use any form of positional encoding? So it's or... our model minus the node identifier. So it only looks at the node and edge attributes. Okay. And not the graph structure. Um, it would have been interesting, like, to look at the transformer here and put the Laplacian embed encoding, but without yeah. the edges. And seeing like, is it really necessary to have this kind of? Oh, you mean the uh, edge encodings, right? Yeah, I mean, edge without, tokens, the, right? without oh. the edge token, for example. We don't. I, I don't know if it would have been. We possible. don't immediately have that number here because in our previous work involving the PCQ endpoint V1, we actually experimented the setup, and the performance is was kind of low. The performance was kind of yeah. very low. I mean, it's kind of worse or a little bit comparable to the best system genus, presumably because it doesn't yeah. have the edge attributes. Yep. Yep. And another question is also like here, um, like you, you use these positional encodings um, yeah. for the token GT. Yep. Uh, but there is not a single like message passing network that uses any form of positional encodings. Oh, yeah. Uh, and as we know, they, they are limited again yeah. by uh, 
by the WL test when they don't mm -hmm. use this kind of positional encoding. So mm -hmm. uh, it would also be very, very interesting to look at, uh, at that because one thing that we found in our graph GPS paper mm -hmm. is that we could have a performance that is uh, only with like a gated GCN or only with mm -hmm. GIN, we could have performance that is very, very close mm, to yeah. the performance of graph former mm -hmm. uh, using only like uh, the right positional encodings. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so here it's uh, still difficult to say like, okay, is your model now outperforming the, mm -hmm. the message passing uh, because like it allows more flexibility or mm -hmm. um, uh, simply because like the positional encoding that you provide to it like gives it so much power over other methods that could also have the same node in embedding and the same mm -hmm. token embedding. Yeah, I think that's a reasonable baseline to try out. I mean, we could uh, intentionally limit the cell potential to local neighborhoods and additionally add the ORF follow up and see if, how the model performs. I, th I think that's also a reasonable baseline. Also, um, another thing uh, here is that you have this n plus m squared instead of having the regular n squared, yeah, right. um, which is like bigger than n squared. Mm -hmm. uh, now, in the case of molecules, um, mm -hmm. because here we're dealing with a molecular graph, we yep. often have that m is around uh, 2n. Yep. So by having m equal 2n, you now have like 9n squared compared to n squared in terms of complexity. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, your architecture is simpler. It's a pure transformer. Yeah, right. Uh, so I'd like to know, like, uh, do you observe, because of this uh, 9 n squared term, mm -hmm. uh, do you observe uh, like uh, problems in terms of uh, memory or speed? Or is, is it still uh, reasonable what you, the compute that you can have with that method? Uh so we did run some experiments with performer and our, little, our model cost a little bit more because of this um, edge tokens and it's a little bit slower but in for the time complexity i'm not sure if that's the problem of the laplace and eigenvectors or the problem of the, using more tokens but, but indeed our model gets a little bit slower and it requires a little bit more memory but it's not that i mean significant to affect the consequence of the training. Okay, cool. Um, and also here you've experimented with performer. Uh, we've yeah. also used performer in another work mm -hmm. and find that it's slower than transformer for small mm -hmm. graphs. In your case, did you observe like performer giving you really an advantage in terms of linearity or yep. uh, is, is it faster actually using performer than transformer in your case? So uh, in terms of training, it's a little bit slower because the random projection dimension is like n log, I'm d log d. Uh, but during inference, it's much more faster. So, I mean- Okay, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I adding... didn't uh, notice the inference time in my case. So maybe, yeah. yeah, okay. That's interesting to see that it's faster at inference. Yeah, there could be some hidden factors, but uh, in our experiments, we observed that the inference time is really faster. Okay, so moving on. Okay, thank you. So uh, for the last top the our models, in the beginning of my talk, I um, ref I mean I mentioned something that uh, using the pure transformers offers us to utilize all the techniques that are available in the panel of transformer literature, right? So to demonstrate that we I mean apply the attention linearization based on performer to our model and fine tune it, I mean, for several epochs. And as a result, we get a best performing model among the linear complexity model in the table. I mean, I mean, excluding the graph GPS. Well, yeah. but right, M is of order N squared, right? So yep. we have something of order N squared here as well. Oh, not exactly because we only see the sparse input. So we only leave the edge tokens for, I mean, the edges that are actually present in the graph. Yeah. yeah. So okay. Hannes, you'll find, uh, you'll find that in most graphs, yeah. uh, M yes, can be, course. is a linear. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, if we assume the sparse graphs, 
that's like n plus m. And if the graph gets dense, then it also becomes a problem for message passing. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, this is kind of the best model among the linear models. And we note that this linear resolution is an exclusive technique that's applicable for pure transformer and not the modified ones. You cannot apply this technique to modified ones because um, this involves factorizing the attention matrix into um, Q transpose K. And you cannot do that when you have the attention bias incorporated into the computation. Yep. So that's the main table here. And after that, um, although our theory guarantees that the, our model can reduce to a KIGN, in practice, it doesn't need to, right? It can just learn whatever computation it wants. And we are curious whether that computation, how the computation looks like. So we visualize the self-attention distance across the graph according to the network depth. This is a very similar visualization to vision transformers. And we found that no matter what kind of node identifiers we use, we see that lower layers learn to attend locally. I mean, local on the graph and deep layers tend to attend globally over the graph. So this is a very consistent observation to the vision transformers. And I think this implies that uh, this kind of, I mean, model with a large degree of freedom adaptively learns graph operation unlike the hard coded GNNs. So uh, let me quickly move to the conclusion. So uh, in summary, these kind of models are powerful graph learners. And what's good about having this kind of model is that they introduce minimal modification to the architecture, theory, and code base. And they are theoretically more expressive than message passing. And they empirically learn well from large scale data due to, uh, despite the simplicity. And we can adopt the transformer specific techniques like colonization directly into our model. But right, we're not so sure about the second point here anymore. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Points brought up. I yeah, I mean, Fabrizio. yeah, I mean, if we use the identifiers, then message passing can be our model and message passing can be universal approximators. Okay, so uh, not exactly sure about the second thing here. Uh, but it's still more expressive than message passing neural networks that do not utilize the yeah. identifiers. Yep. But, but I mean, you do. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a point. Okay. So uh, for the future work, I have some several ideas. So uh, first of all, our model is slightly underperforming compared to the strong modified graph transformer. So our next step would be, I mean, engineering the model to get a state-of-the-art performance. This could involve um, relaxing the orthonormality constraint of the node identifiers and instead moving to more powerful but potentially don't I, I mean don't also normal node identifiers. This can involve learnable positional embeddings that's proposed in Sun and also sign that, uh, that I mean, solve the sign ambiguity of the Laplace and Hagen methods and so on. And we can just try any technique from the um, vision transform literature. This can include self supervision methods like mask autoencoding. And not only that, but also the hybrid architectures. This is a little bit um, cautious because our goal in this work was to not introduce hybrid architectures, but if we aim for a state-of-the-art performance, I think we can do this. And another problem that we need to handle is hand scaling to very large graphs, because when we have very large number of nodes, then having that dimensional node identifier is already too, too I mean, expensive. So in this case, I think we can use some near or so normal like node identifiers. So for example, use um, only a subset of Laplace and eigenvectors. And with that, we can utilize the reversible transformers that allows um, constant memory footprint in terms of the number of the layers. So I think we can try this. And there are other interesting directions that stem from our architecture. So for example, we can just try um, somehow serial, serialize the graph and try just autoregressive graph generation, just impose an order and learn the model to generate the, each token based on the order. And we can, I mean, do some kind of in-context learning. So for example, we can train a model with some kind of condition inside information on the task. 
And we can just um, change the side information here and see if the model can indeed perform some kind of adjusted other task in a few shot or zero shot manner. And in a similar manner, we can test the property. So in addition to the all the graph tokens, we can append a prompt token that encodes the task and see if the model performs well. And lastly, we can um, expand our model to the multimodal learning scenario. So uh, we have our model available in PyTorch in this repository. So please have a look. And yep. Okay, cool. Thank you. So I find especially the um, like the multimodal stuff interesting that mm -hmm. we can maybe pre-train on all sorts of things and then yeah right uh, that this universal graph transformer mm -hmm. as well and I find the idea of the auto regressive graph generation interesting yeah we still uh, have the problem of I mean assigning the orders but I think that's that can be I mean practically um, work well. Yeah, okay, anyway, thanks for the awesome presentation and for answering all our very numerous questions. Um, Thank you very much. Um, any, any other questions? Yeah, thanks a lot, Jinu. It was very interesting. And it's uh, very interesting also how like uh, the tokenization that you used allows for, uh, even though like there's no way, like, there's no direct way for the network to know which edges are connected yep. uh, to which nodes. It's super easy to for the network to do that with a single single attention uh -huh. layer. So in that sense, it makes it very very flexible and powerful. Uh -huh. uh, so I find it uh, quite interesting. Um, just one, one question though: when you discuss uh -huh. about uh, one of the advantage of that architecture uh -huh. is about multimodality. Yeah. Right. But why can't you use uh, message passing also in a multimodal way? I mean, message passing can work on sequences, on images. Mm -hmm. uh, why do you think like uh, this approach is better than uh, yeah than, than uh, sender message passing, for example, for multimodality? Oh yeah, uh, in that case. So I'm assuming that we are using a single modal architecture for all sorts of the modalities. That's the assumption here. Yeah? Uh, and if we use the message passing neural networks, they might work well for graph modality, but I think they will lead to decreased performance in others. So um, because it's empirically known that transformers work well in language and pigeon, I think it's kind of reasonable for graph modality to, I mean, try to adhere to this kind of, I mean, general architecture. That's my assumption. Of course, we can um, take the alternative approach of first encoding a graph using the message passing neural network, and then using the I mean, resulting embeddings to the input of the other models. But uh, that requires some additional engineering that's specific to the message passing neural network, I guess. OK. Yeah, I see. So um, even though message passing can work, it's about the question of expressivity that can be mm -hmm. reduced. Yep. Um, I've seen many recent work though going with a hybrid architecture on both mm -hmm. images. Now, like the, the question is, uh, um, will message passing be weaker than CNN when applied mm -hmm. on images? Mm -hmm. um, in, in general, the answer would be yes. But mm -hmm. when coupled with the transformer in a hybrid architecture, yeah. it's really unclear what would happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and the answer could still be yes, MPNN would be weaker and would weaken yeah. The, yeah. the way. So I see, uh, yeah, I see a good reason for uh, working on this transformer. Uh, yeah, so thanks thank again a lot for the presentation. Is there any other question in the audience? I think there are questions on the limit of number of nodes in training. Uh, in physical and foreign, I think the graphs are pretty small, so there is no need to I mean, put some limit on the number of nodes. But for large graphs, we indeed need to care about the limitation. Uh, I think that depends on the GPU budget you're having. So if your memory is large enough, you can afford a larger number of nodes. 
<laughs> I mean, that's always the case. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, then I would say let's, unless do you want to say some last words? Last words? Uh, not exactly. That's best to play. Okay, but yeah. then, uh, yeah, let's just agree with the last comment in the chat. Very clear, clever work. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, I already told you what future work I'm the most excited about. And maybe you can build the next GPT graph generation model, something like that. Now that we've tokenized everything. And if you want to join future reading group sessions yourself, the information is in the description. See you.